open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. John 7, beginning in verse 1. And this morning, I'm going to read it from the NIB. Those of you who have a more literal translation will do good to follow along and see the meaning of the text. The only reason is because it's a large portion and the NIB renders it in a better flow. John chapter 7, verse 1. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about Judea because the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see your works. No, for no one wants, uh, for no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret, since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore Jesus told them, My time is not yet here, for you any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that his works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not going up to the festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. May God bless the reading of his word in our hearts. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning acknowledging, Lord, that if it's not because of your grace and by your grace alone, we will not be here. And just as we just read in the scriptures, Father, we need your power in order to believe your law, to believe your word, to understand your precepts. This we will not do unless you enlarge our hearts. Help us, therefore, to receive the testimony of your holy word this morning, to see the grandeur and splendor and majesty of your Son, our Savior. May he be glorified always in all things. To him be power and glory and majesty forever, Father. We remember his persecuted body this morning. For his sake we pray. Amen. Well, the first thing we're going to do this morning is we're going to ask this question. And that is, why were the Jews seeking to kill our Lord? Why were the Jews seeking to kill Jesus? And we're going to deal with this question this morning. And this is why I decided to divide this passage. This passage is quite, actually quite long. It goes all the way to verse 24, in which... The purpose of the author is to show us that we must judge with righteous judgment. And he shows to us in the narrative of the text that Jesus was persecuted unjustly. The Jews were seeking to kill him. Now this all comes in the heels of the fact in chapter 6 that we see that many, the great majority of those Jews that were following him all the way to Galilee had abandoned him because what he said, because of his teachings, because he told them that he is their redemption, because he told them that unless they ate his flesh and drunk his blood, they will not be saved. Reminding them of the imagery of the Lamb in the Old Testament. Now we must remember that Jesus had uh, John, rather, in his outline of the gospel, instead of giving us a chronological outline like the rest of the synoptic gospels, John 6, to give us a chronology of the signs and miracles that Jesus performed. And he tells us very clear in chapter 20 that his objective is that by seeing this, by reading of this, we may believe in his name and have 
eternal life. This is the uh, this is the intention of the author. This is the context. So we must remember why were the Jews? Why were the Jews in Judea seeking to kill Jesus? Now the answer is because because of what we see taking place in chapter five. We see that Jesus comes to the uh, city of Jerusalem during one of the festivities. And there he found a man by the pool of Bethesda. A man who had been crippled for 38 years. And Jesus healed this man. And the healing of this man took place on the Sabbath. Hence, breaking their interpretation of the law and tradition that they held about the Sabbath. They, because of this, the Jews in Judea were seeking to kill him. When we find the record here in John chapter 5, we go back to John 5 verse 16. It says, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. And in his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work, even to this very day. I am too also working, he says. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, thus making himself equal with God. Uh, this is the reason why they were seeking to kill him. Now, in passing through here, we must understand that Jesus exposed their religious hypocrisy. The problem here is that Jesus exposed their religious hypocrisy by declaring to them that he had authority to do as he pleased because he was the Lord of the Sabbath and that he is the Lord of of the Sabbath because he is a messianic figure in the book of Daniel identified as the son of man so this is the issue now when we pass through this passage before we ask the question did Jesus give enough evidence to sustain his claims did Jesus give did Jesus present to the Jews enough evidence to sustain his claims? And the answer is yes. Jesus presented to them, uh, excuse me, Jesus presented to them enough evidence to substantiate his claims. But remember, as we have seen in this gospel, the problem is that Jesus is confronted with an unwillingness to submit. Now, we said that when we examine this passage, that in the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus proclaims to them in many ways in the context of the Old Testament with a language that alludes to the prophets and the law about him. For example, in chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says to them that the scriptures that they so diligently uh, search are the very scriptures that give testimony of him. But yet they were not willing to come to him to receive life. Now we also see that Jesus managed to expose their religious rigidity. Jesus also managed to expose their religious rigidity that left no room for mercy. Jesus exposed their inconsistency. Because just as we saw in our passage today, he showed them that if they were willing, he showed them if they were willing to break the Sabbath in order to keep the letter of the law, then why were they not willing to practice compassion in order to keep the heart of the law? And we see this in, in, the, in the context of our passage. We see that Jesus tells them very clear. 
he tells them that they were willing to baptize, excuse me, to circumcise a man. In verse 21, in chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus tells them that they were willing to, to circumcise a man in order to keep the Sabbath. But yet they were not willing to do good to a man in order to keep the heart of the law. Here in, we see the gray folly of the Pharisees and the leaders of the people. This is hearkening back to what Paul said when he says that the letter of the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. It wasn't that Paul was setting the law against the Spirit, but rather saying that if we give ourselves to keep the law and yet neglect the spirit of the law, which is mercy, kindness, compassion, self-control, patience, faith, goodness, then we have nothing. Now we see that Jesus' brothers, we see that Jesus' brothers in John's account, they presented a bit of a sarcastic note. They said, well, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. For no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing all these things, show yourself to the world. Now, it seems that in Jesus' brother's remarks, we see a thinly veiled tone of mockery. We see a thinly veil of sarcasm. It seems as though they are saying, go, if you are the Messiah, why don't you go to the Jews? Right? Now, there are many things we can speculate about as to why and what were the motives of Jesus' brothers in saying these things. But what is clear to us in the text, what the text reveals to us is that they did not yet believe in Christ. That's what verse 5 indicates to us. It says, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. It is possible that in this band of his brothers, these are his brothers in the flesh. It is possible that in this band of brothers, they, uh, there were included also James and Jude, who later became apostles in the church. But what is more interesting is indeed his answer. His answer. Verse 6 tells us, Therefore Jesus told them, my time is not yet here. He says, for you, for you, any time is right. Any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that his works are evil. Now, in this, in this passage, we find so much that is relevant for us in this time. In this words, we find one of the central themes of the Gospel of John, and it is, if it is not also in John, also we find it in the entirety of the New Testament. What is that? What is that? Is this. It is the reaction of the world to the truth is the reaction of the world to the truth. He says, my time is not yet here. And this has to do with the fact that they hated him. They hated him. 
This means that his time to be embraced by the Jews wasn't here yet. Because in the in the remark of his brothers and what they said in their statement, they're saying, well, you, if you want people to follow you, if you want the Jews to embrace you, go to Jerusalem and perform your wonders and they will embrace you. But what he is saying is that his time, the time for him to be embraced by the Jews, by men, was not here. It wasn't yet. So in the meantime, in the meantime, they hated him. So in this, we, we see and exemplify for us the reaction of the world to the truth. How the world, when exposed to the truth, reacts to the truth of God. It was the great Augustine who said, Every, everyone fancies himself to love the truth. Augustine said, everyone fancies himself to love the truth that is unto the truth makes us its victim. Augustine said that everyone wants the truth. Augustine said that everybody seeks after the truth. Every man fancies himself to love the truth, to want the truth. But he says that what we mean by this is that we want the truth about others. He says that what we mean by this, by this is that we want the truth about others, but we do not want the truth about ourselves. To exemplify this, he used an illustration. He said, uh, he, he, this is in his book, The Confessions. He says, the husband, he says, the husband wants the truth if he suspects his wife of being unfaithful. But he does not want the truth if he himself is one. He is saying, yeah, yeah, the husband he wants the truth if he suspects his wife of being unfaithful. But he doesn't want the truth if he himself is one. You see, the religious leaders of the time hated Jesus for this fact. Because he exposed their hypocrisy. Because he exposed their hypocrisy, he threatened their fake religion and their fake religious piety. Now, this is one of the most uh, common reactions of our human nature. See, when confronted with something that is far superior to us, when confronted with something or someone who is superior to us, we feel threatened by it. And our instinctive reaction is to recoil, is to hate it. Just like the, just like the late R.C. Sproul explained in his book, The Holiness of God, he says, he says, no one likes the fellow classmate who always aces the test. No one likes a fellow classmate who, who always knows all the answers. He will never be the most popular guy in the class. Then he has a question, why? Well, the answer is because he is a contrast. Because when we compare ourselves to him, to that who is superior to us, we will always be deficient. In other words, he will make us look bad. And here in is the problem. Jesus made them look bad in front of the people. Henceforth, they hated him. Because he exposed 
their deficiencies. I was just process because this person exposed our deficiencies and never since Cain and Abel, we always seek to kill that which is better than us. And we must understand that this is the way that the world will react to us. In the measure, we become like Christ. You see, the fancy idea that in order to win the world for Christ, we must identify ourselves with the world. This idea is not born from the pages of the New Testament. You see, what will, what will win the world for Christ is the contrast. You see, it is the fact that the power of God works it is the fact that the power of God works in the gospel that calls sinners to repentance and faith. And this faith and repentance is exemplified to them in the lives of those who proclaim this message. Allow me to repeat that. What wings, what wings the world to Christ is the fact that the power of God works in the gospel that calls sinners to repentance and faith. And this faith and repentance is exemplified to them in the lives of those who proclaim this message. You see, for the world, any time is right. But for us, our time is yet to come. Our time is yet to come. Our time will come when His time comes. When He comes to reign, when He is finally embraced by the nations, by that I mean those who believe and repent the gospel, by that I mean those who will be part of His kingdom, those who will reign with him in his new kingdom when he had judged the nations, those who rejected him. When that time comes, our time will come. In the meantime, the world will treat the world will treat us just as it treated him. To close, I will read from the letter of the Apostle Paul to Timothy in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Here Paul speaks of these things. He speaks of the contrast between the world that is falling apart between a world that is seeking his own pleasure, hating God, hating his laws, while sustaining a hypocritical religion, and those who truly follow the way of Christ, and those whose time is not yet here. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, in verse 1, chapter 3, 2 Timothy 3, 1 says, But understand this, he says, that in the latter days there will come times of difficulty. There will be hard times. And he's talking about in the context of being a minister of the gospel and being a minister to the people. And being a Christian. And he explains the reasons why. And then he will tell him. What his attitude should be. In the light of all this upheaval. In the light of all this religious hypocrisy. In the light of the world falling apart. 
in the light of the world, following the way of the world and hating Christ, he tells him how he must react and how he must think and what he should do. So he says, but understand this, that in the latter days there will be difficult times. For people will be lovers of self, people will be lovers of money, they will be proud, arrogant, they will be abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unpeaceable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. If this is not describing what we see in the news today, I don't know what does. If this doesn't describe what we see happening in the culture today, I don't know what does. If this does not describe this nation that calls itself a nation under God, if this does not describe a nation that calls itself Christian, I don't know what does. Paul says, for in the last times, for in the latter days, the reason why it will be so difficult, Paul says, is because there will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, uns unpeaceable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, and not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. If this does not describe America, I don't know what it does. Yet Paul speaks of the church. Because listen to what he says. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying the power of godliness. Having a religion, having a profession of faith. All right. In other words, we could apply this to say, being a nation under God. Paul says, avoid such a people. He says, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and let them stray by various patient, passions, always learning and never able to arrive of the knowledge of the truth. If this does not describe the church in America, I don't know what it does. All right, we have conference after conference. We are fat with theology. There is nothing wrong with theology. We have conferences about this, conferences about that, conferences about the sufficiency of scripture, conferences about the centrality of Christ. And all these themes are wonderful and necessary. But yet, we remain ungodly. And yet, we remain untouched. These conferences will be to our detriment in the day of judgment. Paul says, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. God will expose their folly. You know, it's very interesting that in a nation that being conservative, being conservative, I know the number is higher, but a nation that it claims and it's 60% of it is born again. Yet we see abortion is rampant. 
killing of babies is rampant. The ungodliness, sodomy, the destruction of the nucleus of the family is falling apart. Family is falling apart. The attitude of men and the attitude of women, what feminism rules, when women usurps the authority of men and men is willing to surrender it, when the great absence is men in the churches leading and also in society, when men has become softies, when they're entertained themselves, they're busy playing video games and seeking after pleasure rather than lead their families in daily devotions, praying to God and seeking the kingdom of God and preaching the gospel. And yet, we claim to have a, a nation under God. But God exposes this lie by the fruit of our society. We surrender the mind of our children to the public systems of indoctrination into atheism. And then we wonder why our children are leaving the faith, becoming homosexuals and renouncing kingdom of God. But here comes the conscience. What is the true Christian called to do in the light of all these things? In the light of the great apostasy of the church. Because this is what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the church. He says, yet holding a type of godliness, a type of religion, a profession of faith, while do doing all, all these things. But what should be the true Christian reaction to these things? That's the question, right? In the light of the society, in the light of America falling apart, in the light that America is losing its freedom because there is no virtue in a people, and a people who has no virtue cannot be free because the transgression of the transgressions of the people increases the magistrates. What should be the reaction of the Christian? Should we raise ourselves up in arms and try to save the culture? Is that what we are called to do? Should we mount a crusade to protect our freedoms? Is that what we are called to do? Should we continue to preach the gospel even if our freedoms are taken away? That is the question. What should be the answer of the true Christian to these things? Here for us, the answer is in verse 10. 2 Timothy 3 verse 10. The apostle said, but you. So that means in the light of all these things, the apostle says, but you. Remember, Christ said, my time is not here yet. So what time it is? So what time is it? Paul says, but you. You have followed my teaching, my conduct, you have followed my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. You have followed my persecutions and my sufferings that happened to me when I was in Antioch, in Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. No freedom of religion here. Indeed. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Listen to that. All who desire, not some. 
the Lord said, they hated me. For you, any time is right. Meaning the love of the world is for you. The world loves you because you are all the world, but not me. All, he says, will desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters, he says, will go from bad to worse, while this society is waxing off into evil and decay, while they're deceiving and being deceived, says Paul, but as for you, while all this is taking place in the religion of the world, in the religion of the nation, but as for you, he says, continue fighting for freedom. <laughs> Is that what he says? He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. For all scripture, it is the very breath of God and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for corruption, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. For the world, any time is right. But for us, our time is not yet. So in the meantime, let us continue to do and remain steadfast in the things that Christ have given to us has given to us to do. What are those things? First, raising our families in the fear of the Lord, loving our wives as Christ has loved the church, sacrificing ourselves in the living room of our home, discipling our children, teaching them to love Christ, to love his kingdom, so that in time they may rest, raise godly children themselves, so that in this way the kingdom of Christ prolific and it continues to advance and discipling the nations to the glory of Christ. Freedom of religion notwithstanding. Who knows, maybe the time where we have to pay the price of discipleship be upon us. The point I'm trying to make is that the fact that the exception is being taken away from us must not be the occasion for us to fall apart. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for your kindness, your mercy. We give you praise glory and honor. May we be strengthened with a biblical view of Christianity. And I pray for those who may hear this message. And may be edified and challenged to be biblical through repentance and faith. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.